Many people are shocked to learn that turbochargers have been a big part of drag racing for nearly 60 years on a high level and a lot longer than that in the hands of tinkering hot rodders around the world. This video is not a comprehensive history of turbos and drag racing, but it is the story of two cars, one primarily that gave a very, very advanced look at what modern drag racers and hot rodders now take for granted, the fact that turbos make stupid horsepower when used on big, honking V8 engines. When Oldsmobile launched their ill-fated 1962 turbocharged F-85 Jetfire, they were unwittingly opening a new dawn in automotive production. That car was the first mass-produced V8 automobile that was sold with the turbocharger. The results were a disaster on paper. Produced from 1962 through the end of 63, the cars were fast for their 215 cubic inch displacement, but the fact that the engines had 10.75 to 1 compression and owners didn't understand or perhaps just were totally ignorant to the fact that they needed to keep the underhood bottle of water and alcohol full to prevent the engine from detonating to death, along with other maintenance issues, allowed so many problems that Oldsmobile actually offered F85 Jetfire owners the option to bring their cars into the dealership, have the turbochargers removed and have the engines put back to a naturally aspirated state. Wildly, most owners did it. While that car may have failed commercially, hot rodders around the country took some notice of this device, which was still commonly called a turbo supercharger. These things were commonly found on big diesel engines back then and on airplanes, but not typically on gasoline burning cars. But if they can make a little 215 cubic inch Oldsmobile engine fly, why not something else? Fast forward to 1965, and a pair of industrious drag racers on the West Coast, Gary and Jerry Malicote, have an idea. They want to convert their blown gas supercharged willies from the traditional roots blower over to turbos. Easier dream than done, except they had help. Ed Eskandarian became their champion on the project. His dyno became their test lab, and through loads of phone calls and horse wrangling, they got a pair of turbochargers from the famed Air Research Division of Garrett. And once they had those, their plan really began to come together. The engine was a 327 cubic inch small block Chevy, which used Carter AFB carburetors in a draw-through arrangement. By the time the months of work on the dyno were complete, it was making more than 720 horsepower, which was an incredible figure for the day. After relentless testing, the development of a trick B&M hydro transmission that used special Taurus members, which allowed for a 4,300 RPM stall speed, they tested the race car, went to the NHRA Winter Nationals, and crushed everybody in B-Gas supercharged. They went 1035 at 135 miles an hour and drove themselves straight into drag racing history. The unique nature of the car blew people away. Promoters immediately melted their phone down and they went on a season-long national match racing journey before coming home, taking the car apart, and going back to regular life. The brothers would continue drag racing for decades and their work as turbo pioneers continued into the 70s and beyond, but that car is not why we're here. As all that was happening, 2,500 miles to the east, a young engineer named Bob Keller was elbows deep into a dream project that was at times doubling as a nightmare. But again, I'm rushing the story. Bob Keller took an engineering job at Grumman Corporation in Bethpage, New York in 1960. As a young guy, he was an avid hot rodder, and as an engineer at one of the country's most advanced aircraft companies, he was involved in a lot of interesting work. Bob Keller was a little different than most, though. He was a high-level thinker who also had the fabrication skills to explore ideas. Those fabrication skills were a direct result of the work he was doing at Grumman, where he was certified as a welder and made proficient in every known genre of that skill set that existed back in the day. Hot rodding and his profession began to collide when Keller became fascinated with turbochargers. Often used on airplane engines, their migration to cars had been very slow, but they were on big heavy-duty trucks and large diesel engines. His contacts with the air research wing of Garrett, specifically a man named Wolf Schlegel, tipped him off to the production of a new model from Oldsmobile, as well as a new turbocharged model from Chevrolet in 1962. Of course, the Olds was the F-85 Jetfire, and the Chevrolet was the Corvair Monza. Leveraging those contacts, Keller bought himself what he called a Christmas present in 1962, a full Garrett turbocharger unit destined for an Oldsmobile engine, except he mounted his to the Slant 6 powering his Valiant convertible. Schlegel and Keller saw eye-to-eye -eye on many things, turbocharging being number one. They started a company called Turbonics, where people could contact them, and for a few bucks, they'd recommend what turbocharger to size with their project. As well, they could order turbos direct from Garrett, which people at home really couldn't do. This small business began to take off, and so what about the Valiant? As tricky as it is to mount turbos now and fabricate the plumbing, imagine doing it in 1964. Modifying the intake manifold to accept the awkward, bulky turbo unit, running all the piping, getting the carburation right, the list of issues was endless. The result? 
Keller had what was likely the fastest slant six powered anything in the country at that time, and it caught the attention of a journalist named Alex Willorty. Bob Keller first got ink for turbocharging in the December 1964 issue of Speed and Custom magazine. The story was written by Willorty, and it was effusive in its praise for what he had done and how well the car ran. As clunky and large as the Ozobile unit is, you can see the install is reasonably clean, and the story claimed that the power output of the engine was up over 50% with just bolting this stuff on. Keller even kept the same carburetor that was intended for the Olds engine, as the displacement was only 10 cubic inches different. Where Lordy was blown away by the way the car pulled, and after that racing season had neared its end, he asked Keller when he was going to stop playing with quote-unquote toys and do something with a lot of power that involved turbochargers. Keller jokingly told Willorty that if he supplied the car and the money, Keller himself would provide the intellect and then they'd get right on whatever this dream project was. Well, Willorty called him out. Two weeks after making that quip, Keller was in the Manhattan office of the Chrysler Corporation's PR and marketing wing. He was pitching the idea for an engineering experiment that would effectively look like the stalker to end all stalkers. Dick Maxwell, who ran the racing program at Chrysler, had no plans to turbocharge anything but he did see this as an R&D exercise that the company couldn't miss. In the back of his mind, we have to believe that Maxwell was also thinking about Ford. The companies were battling, and Ford was in the midst of its total performance era. If he didn't hire Keller to do something cool, they likely would. Pennsylvania car dealer and nationally known stock and super stock racer Bud Fobble was contacted, and his 1964 Hemi car was re with 1965 sheet metal and was to be used as the rolling stock for the very first twin-turbocharged Hemi-powered anything ever built. The men tasked with building the car were Bob Keller, Bill Shoneman, Wolf Schlegel, and Fobble's longtime head wrench George Weiler. The car would go on to prove to be one of the most amazing engineering exercises attempted in the sport of drag racing during the decade of the 1960s. Hence, the Turbo Honker was born. So let's start with the turbos. How were they selected? Well, Wolf Schlegel of Garrett got with his colleague Chuck McKierney to aid in the process. McKierney was integral here because of the fact that the guys did use some empirical data they had learned from the Valiant Project, but also they needed McKierney's access to the York Division of Borg Warner. They had a massive computer there that was able to do mathematical computations on airflow and thermal dynamics. And after consulting the data that the computer spit at them, they made their decision. And that decision was bold. A pair of Air Research T18 turbos were selected. These are monstrous 140 millimeter pieces. They are huge, but they're the only thing the company had that was large enough to support a 426 Hemi at RPM. And even though they were way too big for the engine, it was better than having too little turbo. At least that's what the guys thought at the time. Next up would come the intake manifold. This is a particular piece of the car that Bob Keller has kept in his possession for his entire life. The intake was a one-off piece made by Hillborn that featured not one, but two sets of nozzles for each runner. In a move that was both brilliant and decades ahead of its time, Keller set the fuel system to run on one set of nozzles until boost levels rose. At that point, the second nozzles would begin introducing fuel to feed the increase in air volume. But it gets even better from there. The car used air-to-water intercoolers. In some reporting on the car when it was new, it is said that this is the first car. Now, trucks had used them with turbocharged diesels, but as far as a car goes, the first car to have air-to-water intercooling for the intake charge. These were one-off, custom-built units made by the Aeroplane Corporation of Norfolk, Virginia. The intercoolers were made to the exact shape and size to fit the inner fenders of the car. There were 88 heat absorption coils that handled 5 gallons a minute of water touched up with some Mopar coolant, circulating from a pair of oxygen tanks turned water coolant tanks in the trunk. These intercoolers took a 350-degree charge and made it into the 100-degree neighborhood at first, but when dry ice was added, they got even more efficient and inlet temps dropped below 100 degrees. Not fantastic by modern standards, but a total win for back then. Other than that, the car did not have any traditional cooling system as it ran on methanol alcohol and would only run for short bursts down the drag strip. As you can tell by virtually every photo of the car, there are loads and loads of aircraft parts on it. From the beautifully bent lines to the high-quality fittings, the huge 5-inch tubing used for exhaust, the former oxygen-turned-coolant tanks, and on and on. So why is this? Well, it's because of where Keller worked. Almost all the big tubing you see was scrounged out of the scrap pile at Grumman. Those super professional-looking hard lines bent like they belong in an airplane? Well, they probably did. They were all made by his friends in various fabrication shops at the plant. In parts and pieces, Grumman may have invested more than anybody else in this thing unwittingly. The amount of money in fittings, form tubing, and other small things would be astronomical back then as much as it would be today. So what about the rest of the engine? Outside of a drastic reduction in compression down to 7.5 to 1, nothing much changed. Keller said that the hard parts outside of the pistons were as delivered inside the 426 Hemi 
and the responsibility for maintaining it was all George Weiler's. So the challenges to make all of this work were many, and they were varied. For starters, modern quick-acting wastegates didn't exist like we have them today, and yes, there were pressure relief valves used here, but they were really slow to act and didn't necessarily manage the boost in the way guys wanted. In fact, more than once, the valves themselves were blown completely off the tubing, despite being expertly welded. Oh, speaking of boost, 30 to 40 PSI was the target here, and that was all being done via theoretical math by the guys who were putting the car together. The mass of turbos, beyond what anybody would use today, had a different theory, and we'll get to that in a minute. So how did it run? It did exactly what many of you watching this would expect it to do. The car would leave the line, popping and banging, sounding like junk. Then about 100 feet out, the turbos would spool, and Bud Fobble would be on the ride of his life. The speeds produced were absolutely tremendous by the turbo honker. In fact, the very first weekend they ran it, the car went more than 160 miles an hour. It does need to be mentioned again that every inch of this car was mechanical. No electronics, nothing other than good old analog stuff to make it all work. Incredible, right? Through the course of the 1966 season, they ran the car many times, never in a class, just as a testing exercise. According to Bob Keller, the major issues were killing transmissions, mostly input shafts, trying to get the two-stage fuel injection system to work as advertised, and getting the way-too-huge turbos to spool as soon as possible. When it worked, this car would smoke the tires through the entire quarter mile like a fuel dragster. Keller claims the best speed they ever ran was 172 miles an hour, which is a truly mind-boggling number, even more wild when you consider top fuel cars of the day were only running about 20 miles an hour faster. Bud Fobble was once quoted as saying, the turbo honker scared the out of me. The thing would just never stop accelerating. Keller claims that on the 172 mile an hour run, the engine saw 60 psi of boost. He knows this because it had pegged and broken a 60 psi pressure gauge he had as part of the instrumentation on the car. It also, once again, shot the relief valves right off the tubing. This 4,000 pound beast, the rolling test lab that it was, never set any official records, never won a race, but continues to capture our imagination today. Unlike the Malico Brothers Willys with its smaller engine, smaller turbos, and more conservative but highly successful approach, this monster lived for a season and was summarily taken apart. Fobble would continue racing. Keller would go on to start Turbinetics with his friends Wolf Schlegel and Bill Schoneman. That company would blaze a trail through the decades and revolutionize the way hot rodders, drag racers, and horsepower lovers used turbocharging in their own programs. In fact, it basically launched an entire wing of the high-performance aftermarket that really didn't exist before that point. In conversation with Keller, he claims that the 426 Hemi block that came out of the car at the end of the year was distorted a quarter-inch corner-to-corner because of the massive torque loads it was receiving through all the track testing. Tall tail? Heck, the whole thing sounds like a tall tail, so why should we disbelieve this? Occasionally, parts from the car will pop up. Sheet metal, an odd piece of engine tubing here or there. Keller still owns the intake, one of the more awesome pieces of the whole operation. The Turbo Honker taught drag racing that there were more ways to make power than simply burning nitro. There was the engineer's touch, the creative path that could be used as well. If given more budget, more time, and more attention, the Turbo Honker could have evolved into a car that saw weekly duty at strips across the country, but honestly, that wasn't the point. Bob Keller and Wolf Schlegel proved everything they needed to, both to themselves and to hot rodding. The turbocharging was smart, viable, and downright awesome when it came to power on the strip in the street. The Turbo Honker has been gone for decades on end, but its legacy can be seen at virtually every drag strip in America, from test and tune warriors to turbocharged pro mods. All those cars have a small piece of the Turbo Honker's DNA in them. Perhaps drag racing's greatest science project of the 60s, we still can't get enough of it. 140 millimeter turbos. And two of them. Wild. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more drag racing and hot rodding historical content.